It once was the palace of the czars and empresses, created to be the cultural and political heart of an enormous empire to rival the Western world. This is the Hermitage of St. Petersburg, the capital of Russia for over 200 years, and now one of the world's largest museums. Catherine the Great built the Hermitage and amassed an art collection to set Russia on a par with Western Europe as an enlightened modern nation. In this program, you'll walk the splendid palaces that represent the flowering of Russian architecture. You'll delve into the tense and energetic times of 18th century Russia, and you'll learn how this palace of emperors became home to one of the greatest art collections in the world. The city of St. Petersburg was founded on the Baltic Sea coastline, won from Sweden by Peter the Great in the Northern War of 1700. For Russia, ownership of this land changed everything. It was a window to the west for a huge landlocked nation. Seafaring trade with the west brought not only economic riches, but contact with European culture and sophistication. Peter the Great himself designed a master plan for St. Petersburg and declared it the new capital of a growing empire. His plan combined the city's island topography with the European city design he so admired. Sometimes called the Venice of the North, St. Petersburg is a mix of water and land, linked by more than 300 bridges connecting over 100 islands. Peter looked to the West for architects, artists, and craftsmen to create the atmosphere of a European city and royal court. Fifty years after his death, Empress Elizabeth followed his lead in commissioning an Italian architect to design a new palace. Here is his portrait, Bartolomeo Rastrelli. Completed in 1762, it was called the Winter Palace, the style was Baroque, typical of the mid-18th century. The sculpted forms and the richness of the ornamentation are hallmarks of the Baroque style. The magnificent ambassador staircase was the dramatic entrance to the Winter Palace. Here, Catherine the Great received foreign dignitaries. Her reign marked the rededication and expansion of Peter the Great's drive toward westernization of Russia through culture. A key aspect of this drive was the creation of impressive architecture befitting an important Western power. The physical scale itself is impressive. Painters opened the ceilings to the heavens, with images suggesting that the events in this room are so important and the mortals so fascinating that even the gods have come down from the clouds. Indeed, the life of Catherine the Great has fascinated generations. Born a little-known German princess, she was invited to Russia as a girl by the childless Empress Elizabeth. Elizabeth took a liking to Catherine and groomed the princess to be the bride of her adopted son and successor, Peter III. At 15, Catherine converted to the Russian Orthodox faith and soon after wedded Peter III. But the 17-year-old Peter proved mentally, physically and politically inept, spending the bulk of his time playing with his tin soldiers. His capricious decisions angered his military advisors. They turned to Catherine, and backed by the palace guards in 1762, Catherine ended Peter III's six-month reign. Nine days later, under house arrest, Peter died under suspicious circumstances. History would remember Catherine the Great as one of the most effective and colorful rulers the nation had ever known.
Catherine commissioned these ornate and grand palaces to reflect the emerging stature of the new Russia. Notice the combined grandeur and intimacy of the unique military gallery and its warm woodwork. The fantastic main hall. Fire devastated the Winter Palace in 1837. These watercolors show the restored throne room after Russian architect Vasily Stasov and 8,000 workmen completed the recreation. The new decor included proud lines of columns reflecting early 19th century tastes, the neoclassical empire style. Architect Carl Rossi created the military gallery. It stands as a memorial to the Russian heroes of the War of 1812. The glorious equestrian portrait is of Tsar Alexander I, Catherine's grandson, who ruled during the war. The French Emperor Napoleon almost conquered Russia in the War of 1812. He drove his armies all the way from France, only to be turned back on the outskirts of Moscow. Field Marshal Kutuzov was commander-in-chief of the Russian army. And there are 332 more portraits here in the military gallery, all of heroes of the War of 1812, each one expressly painted for the gallery. Here is Prince Bagration, who was mortally wounded in the war. The palace fire of 1837 might have destroyed all these works if it were not for the palace guards who risked their lives to save them. The patriot Denis Davidoff and Alexander I. At heavy cost, the Russians had retreated to Moscow. The Russians were so sure they would lose the war that they themselves burned the Tsar's splendid private apartments in Moscow to keep them from Napoleon. But the retreat had lured Napoleon's army 1,000 miles from home into the frigid Russian winter. Debilitated by the journey, the French army lost the battle. Many of those who survived the combat fell victim to the cold or starvation on their long, tragic retreat back to France. The grave importance of the war and the victory is evident in canvases throughout the palace. The glory of the emperor and the triumph in battle were matters of life, death, and the survival of the nation. These crossed Latin monograms are symbols of the nation in Peter the Great's room at the Winter Palace. Peter actually lived in a previous palace, surrounded by extensive gardens, and before that, in a log cabin while construction took place. But it was to the advantage of the rulers who followed to stand in the reflected glory of his tremendous prestige. So a suitable room was built to immortalize the image of the man who founded St. Petersburg and gave Russia its window to the west. These are the private rooms of the palace where the Tsars and Tsarinas lived. In keeping with the fashion of royal courts throughout Europe, Catherine sought refuge from the demands of court etiquette in here. She relaxed with her closest friends in an intimate environment filled with all manner of wondrous rare objects and impressive works of art. Catherine played host to a lively circle of intellectuals, which included the French philosopher Voltaire and the French encyclopedist Diderot. Late in her reign, she began to realize that the horrors of the French Revolution that so shocked her as a ruler had their roots in the teachings of the thinkers she had so admired.
This is the bather of 1724 by the French painter Francois Lemoyne. It was acquired for Catherine by Diderot himself. Whether she was truly an enlightened monarch is an interesting question. Catherine had taken control of the government in a palace coup, but then so did five other rulers before her. She expanded the Russian Empire from Poland to Alaska and from the Baltics to the Near East. She brutally suppressed peasant rebellions, imposed serfdom on new regions, and extended new privileges to the upper classes. At the same time, this militaristic imperial monarch embraced Western art and culture. She wrote plays, memoirs, and stories. She was intrigued by the ethical and moral values of enlightened humanistic philosophers. It is these contradictions, perhaps, that make Catherine so fascinating and so worthy of the title, The Great.
undergone few changes in the 20th century. Installed in the late 1800s, it represents one of the last major changes to the Hermitage in Tsarist times. Here, again, a style from the past is revived in a later age. Born in the Middle Ages, the popular Gothic style has spanned the globe as well as the centuries, even up to the present day. With its associations to manuscripts, books, and monasteries, it seems singularly appropriate for a palace library, a place for quiet reading and reflection. And notice that the entire room is fashioned from wood. Many of the books housed behind these carved, arched wooden doors are the very volumes collected by Catherine the Great herself. Later in her reign, Catherine wrote to Frederick Grimm, the French intellectual, that her library consisted of 3,800 books. At that time, they filled four rooms. Catherine may have been a strong and sometimes tyrannical ruler, but her tremendous contribution to the culture of the nation is unquestioned. This lovely chandelier of red, green, and clear glass originally was designed to hold handmade wax candles. In modern days, it has suffered an awkward adaptation to electric bulbs. In spite of this travesty, the chandelier retains much of its colorful gaiety, if not its original grace. In 1763, Catherine gave orders to begin construction of these rooms. They were her first addition to the Winter Palace. She called them her Hermitage. To the French court, a Hermitage was a pleasure pavilion designed for games, concerts, and performances. Two pavilions would be joined by a hanging garden. The niche of the North Pavilion was designed by a pair of architects, one French, one Russian. The team of Vélin de la Morte and Yuri Felton, the styles of ancient Rome, the East, and Renaissance Italy were combined into a new style now sweeping Europe. It was given the name Neoclassical. It looked back in time to the wonders of past civilizations, to bring to the present their sense of balanced classical beauty. The fierce head of Medusa in a Roman mosaic floor is combined with the shells of the Fountain of Tears, designed after an ancient palace in the Near East. This mix of ancient forms is typical of the neoclassical era. When the fountain is operating, the shells of white marble catch and spill water in a staggered fashion. The shells are affixed to a pink and white marble wall and surrounded by decorative columns framed with a delicate arch. Nearby stands the marble staircase. The greenhouse was lined with impressive paintings for Catherine's intimate receptions. Here in the depths of the Russian winter, flowers, birds and even monkeys cheered Catherine and her guests in an environment that mimicked the warmth of an Italian spring. It seems rather ironic from this view, but less than 10 years after the construction began, this building was given the name the Small Hermitage. And in 1771, a structure of even more monumental proportions was to join the Winter Palace and the pavilions along St. Petersburg's Neva River. In keeping with its proportions, it would be called the Large Hermitage. This time, architect Yuri Felton joined Raphael Loggia to design this new structure to house Catherine's ever-growing art collection. Construction would span the years between 1771 and 1787. The rooms that follow at the Large Hermitage are preserved just as they were originally designed.
This is Leonardo da Vinci's Benoit Madonna of 1478. It portrays a young Mary who plays with her child just like any ordinary mother. The artfully displayed work was purchased long after Catherine the Great's reign by museum directors in the late 1800s. The room was once the main drawing room of the large Hermitage. Here, the neoclassical style turns to rich embellishment. Graceful columns frame these expressive statues with the backdrop of this finely embroidered tapestry. Colorful stone wainscoting surrounds the base of the room with veined jasper. These enormous and lavishly decorated doors are fashioned from gilded brass. They are crowned with oval medallion portraits of Russian generals. During her 34-year reign, Catherine had gathered the finest craftsmen and artists of Europe and her native land to finish these three splendid palaces. But the completion of the Hermitage as it now stands would be left to another generation. Her grandson, Nicholas I, would build the fourth and final structure, the new Hermitage. This building would be destined for public use. These majestic Atlantes were carved from blocks of granite to support the entrance. It was created not as a palace, but as a museum and eventually all the world would be able to see the beautiful treasures previously reserved for royal eyes alone. Designed by the German architect Leo von Klenze, the new Hermitage opened its doors in 1852. In just over a decade, the museum was given a director and independent status from the palace. The extensive museum collection is displayed in 60 rooms of the new Hermitage. On the ground floor, you see rooms of ancient and modern sculpture. This hall is devoted to classical works. Its design combines Roman and Renaissance forms into a grand vaulted ceiling soaring over the varied collection of sculptures below. The Greek Etruscan room with its vases is the culmination of one of the ground floor suites of rooms. The creators of the Hermitage collection took great care not to omit any period of art history from the museum. And where no good example was available, they chose simply to recreate the missing element as part of the museum itself. This is the Hall of 20 Columns, a reproduction of the interior of an antique temple complete with paintings and floor mosaics. The new Hermitage's main staircase is the public entrance to the museum. Soon after its construction, the museum would become an invaluable resource. Here, for the first time, young artists could study the great European masters without leaving Russia the museum became a center for the study of art, for painters, art historians, and researchers alike. Here, where masterpieces of sculpture are now exhibited, reproductions of antique paintings were etched into the walls using an authentic ancient method of wax painting. Here, the paintings of Spanish and Italian artists are displayed in bays to set off the individuality of each work. A succession of stone lamps emerge from the floor below to light the way. The gilded commodious armchairs and sofas with their bright velvet upholstery and carved decorations are original designed by the German architect Leo von Klenze himself. 
the grand Italian skylight floods the gallery with natural illumination. The dark red walls are contrasted by gilded, molded ornamentation against a sky blue background. Notice the countless fabulous stone carvings of lapis lazuli and malachite that appear time and again throughout the galleries. Like the carvings in the fabulous malachite room of the palace, these works of the Ural Mountain Russian craftsmen represent a level of skill that make them a truly Russian art form. Notice the tremendous scale of this malachite vase. The Hermitage Museum stands as the cultural heart, not only of St. Petersburg, but of the nation. It was not built by accident, but with tremendous force and determination. And the story of how these buildings came into existence is also the story of the creation of a city. The museum now consists of four enormous former palaces that stretch for over half a mile along the Neva River in the heart of St. Petersburg. Once the private pleasure pavilion of one of the most powerful absolute monarchs in the world, the Hermitage today is open to all. Three and a half million visitors each year can witness the finest that Western art and culture have to offer. <laughs>